Hello everyone, you are all welcome to today's presentation uh, by the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. I am Ivan Zolo, I'm the president of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons and it's a pleasure to have you all today. Today we have a, the pleasure to have uh, to receive Professor Salome from the University of Cape Town who is going to uh, give us a talk. But before we move to the uh, uh, presentation program, I would like to uh, say some few words about Professor Salome. Professor Salome, is an associate professor and the head of global surgery at the University of Cape Town. She is an obstetrician and gynecologist. All right, Professor Salome uh, uh, was a director, was a, was a Discovery MGH research fellow in 2018 at the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Harvard Medical School in the United States. She is a, a former lecturer at, at the Wits University and uh, she is a global surgery expert. She is also an advocate for women health rights and uh, equity in surgical and maternal care. Professor Salome is an advisor and consultant at the WHO. She received numerous uh, awards for her work in maternal health. She has worked with in uh, various, she has worked in various hospitals in South Africa, including the Chris Honey Bar Baraguana Academic Hospital in Soweto, Johannesburg for approximately 10 years. Professor Salome, we are honored to have you today as our guest. Before we move to our presentation, I would like to uh, give the floor to the uh, panel members to present themselves. So uh, the first on my list is for Dr. Aminata Sara, please. Can you unmute yourself and present yourself? Um, good evening, um, I'm Aminata Sala. Uh, very happy to be here and um, looking forward to the talk. Um, I'm from the Gambia. I live in Namibia, fourth year neurosurgery registrar and uh, training in Zimbabwe. Thank you very much. Dr. Sal Dr. Aminata is all over Africa. <laughs> all right, uh, next on the list is uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Safari. Please, Dr. Daniel, can you unmute and present yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Dr. Daniel Safari in Terania, a young medical doctor from Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm actually uh, working at the University Clinics of Bukavu as a uh, uh, an assistant in surgery department, and equally as a research fellow uh, at Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. I'm glad to be with you this evening. Thank you very much, Safari. Next is Darwin Sishimba. Please, can you present yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Darwin Sishimba. I'm a medical student from the Copa Belt University School of Medicine in Zambia, and I'm the director of operations for the association. Association of East African Neurosurgeons. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Ola Ola Ezekiel. Please, can you present yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Ola Ola Ezekiel. I'm a second year medical student from the University of Ibad, Nigeria, and a member of um, operations department, Haifan. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Jodoni. Upon the, please, can you present yourself? Okay. Next on the list is Francois Xavier. Please, Francois Xavier, can you present yourself? Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. My name is Rutaisre Francois Xavier in neurosurgery at the University of Rwanda in year one. Thank you very much. Next on the list is Dr. Stefan Gembu. Please, can you present yourself? Sorry, half a friend there. Next on the list is Takut Singh Bejo. Please, Takut Singh, can you present yourself? I'm called Singh Bejo, City Medical Student of the University of Boya, Cameroon, member of IFAN. Thank you very much. Next is uh, uh, Tunde. Please, Tunde, can you present yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Tunde Olobatuki from College of Medicine, University of Lagos, here in Nigeria. I'm a fourth year medical student and a member of IFAN. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Umu Tony Alice. Please, can you present yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Umu Tony Alice. Uh, currently doing uh, general medicine and surgery at the University of Rwanda, level three. I'm a member of AFAN. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last but not the least, Dr. Or, please, can you present yourself? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ulrich Sidney, the founder of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor Salome, for uh, giving us some of your time and presenting today. 
we look forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I am Ivan Zolo, as I already said, President of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. I'm a final year medical student from Cameroon. But uh, Professor Salome, you have the floor, please. Uh, you can move on to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I'm really delighted to, to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me. Also, thank you for, for giving me the topic that you gave me, because as you know, it, it covers well, it moves well between my personal speciality, the work that I've done in global surgery, and also going into global neurosurgery. I'm delighted to meet all of you. Some of you have read about you, seen you on Twitter everywhere. And so it's really such a delight to be with you tonight. Uh, so I'll go right ahead and I hope you can all see my screen. Um, just gonna enlarge it quickly. Okay, so as the topic that I'm taking you through today, it's what African neurosurgeons can learn from African perioperative outcomes for obstetric and gynecology. And those that know me well will know that I've spent a lot of my time and research on obstetric surgery. And that's really how I've framed my talk. I'm going to talk a bit about my background just so that you can understand where I come from, what I do. And uh, then I'm going to move into the various components of surgery, looking at surgery as a human right, access to cesarean section, perioperative complications and surgical system strengthening. So this is just my background. I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist, as you know. And afterwards, I decided to take the route of, of doing a PhD. And that's really how I ended up uh, in, in global surgery. I did a PhD, which looked at cesarean section outcomes and looking at measures to reduce maternal mortality and, and morbidity. And so with that found, you know, health system strengthening was a key component of that and really found myself balancing between working as a clinician and working as a scientist, looking at surgical out outcomes and health systems. And later in 2019, I was uh, employed by, by the University of Cape Town uh, as head of global surgery. And so over the past two years, we've really been developing our global surgery division. And so this is where my life moved from, from one minute doing community obstetrics to the next moment, uh, look, heading up global surgery and trying to understand how we, can surgical, how we can strengthen surgical systems across all the surgical disciplines. And so, as you know, my work has been mainly about how do we make cesarean section safer for African mothers? And so an important lesson that we learned through, through my work, initially through my PhD, and later through other research that I've been part of, is that patients are more likely to survive life-threatening surgical complications in a functional health systems where multidisciplinary care is available. And so this is what the take-home message that I'm going to give you today, that health systems matters. It's not only about the surgery that you're doing, it's about the health system that you are operating in. So surgery as a human right, and I think for obstetrics care, for obstetrics as a discipline, I think what has really changed uh, our outcomes or what has improved is, is the view that maternal health is a human right and starting to look at issues around equity and ensuring that, ensuring that surgical outcomes across the world improve. And so if you look at various definitions, health equity is about ensuring that the absence of, it's, it's, create, it's ensuring that there's an absence of avoidable, unfair, remediable differences among groups of people, whether they are defined socially, economically, or demographically, or geographically. And this, which is really an important part of, of global surgery and population, population health, looking in trying to ensure that people across different populations or across different geographical uh, locations have got equal access to care. Social justice, of course, is another theme that is, tightly, that is tied closely to this. Social justice is a just distribution of goods within society. It examines the relationships between groups and individuals that influence the distribution of goods. It entails advocating for the poor and for social 
solutions to structural barriers that deny them access to affordable, adequate health care. And so the work we do is also about ensuring that there is social justice. It's trying to remove those barriers to access to surgical care. A human right is def defined as a human that uh, health as a human right creates a legal obligation on countries to ensure access to timely, acceptable, and affordable health care of appropriate quality to provide for the underlying determinants of health, such as safe and potable water, sanitation, food, housing, health related information, education, and gender equality. And so I've raised these because you know the work that we do is really rooted in these ensuring that uh, health is seen as a human right, ensuring that there's equity and social justice. And so when we start to look at healthcare from this perspective, surgical care and neurosurgical care, I think then we move closer towards achieving the universal health, uh, the sustainable development goals and ensuring that there's universal uh, health coverage. So global neurosurgery, and of course I'm not a neurosurgeon, so my perspective on this will always be limited and I will always appreciate more from those of you who work in neurosurgery and are looking at this every day. But what do we know? Low and middle income countries have not benefited uh, from advancements in neurosurgery. Most low and middle income countries have minimal or no neurological, uh, neurosurgical capacity. Early neurosurgery has been focused around neurosurgery camps. And those of you who have been obviously following the COVID situation, the pandemic, it has affected all of us because even these mission trips are no longer possible with count borders closing. But more recently, neurosurgery is also focusing on, on, on strengthening surgical systems and providing cost-effective equitable care. So global neurosurgery by definition, which has been adopted from the global surgery definition, it's been defined as an area of research, uh, study, practice, and advocacy that places priority on improving health outcomes and achieving health equity for all people worldwide who are affected by neurosurgical conditions or have a need for neurosurgical care. And you guys will be the ones to tell me how close we are to achieving that, particularly in Africa. There is a paucity of neurosurgeons in Africa. You know, for the number of other surgical specialities, we know that neurosurgeons, cardio cardiothoracic surgeons have got probably the lowest number of surgeons in, 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 in Africa. And this means that patients who need neurosurgical care do not have access to care. Uh, Africa 50 is 15% of the global burden of neurosurgical disease occurs in Africa, but less than 1% of neurosurgeons in the world are in Africa. So again, raising up the issue of if we don't have neurosurgeons, then what is happening to patients who need neurosurgical care? Whilst we may all agree that it's a human right to have this, to have care, but if there are no neurosurgeons, that means that people, our people don't have the care that they should be getting. What is the reason for the shortage? Lack of financial remuneration, lack of equipment and facilities, unstable socio-political situations, and neurosurgery not seen as a public health priority. And I think I'm encouraged when I see uh, the, the work that you guys are doing, because in what you are doing, you are also advocating for neurosurgery as a public health priority, and also encouraging the next generation to become neurosurgeons. So I'll talk about access to surgery, and I'm going to go specifically into cesarean sections, and then I'll move into, go, go talk a bit about neurosurgery. So 30 million cesarean sections are performed globally every year. Uh, cesarean sections are the most widely performed surgical procedure globally in Africa. Just about any hospital you walk into can provide a cesarean section. But in most hospitals, especially district hospitals, that's the only surgery that can be done. Cesarean sections, whilst are, are done widely, but in many parts of the continent are still considered a death sentence by many Africans because we have seen the number of deaths related to complications uh, related to cesarean sections. And then there's a high maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality associated with cesarean sections. 
So social determinants of health are what determine whether patients are able to get the healthcare that they deserve. The patient who's more educated, who's employed, who's got food security, water security, and sanitation, uh, who lives in an equitable society and has infrastructure is more likely to access the care that they need. So it's taking that step back to say, which what enables patients to access the care that they need. We did this, we published this paper in the conversation a few years ago. And this was at a time where we felt that access to cesarean section would solve a lot of the problems that we have in Africa. And we published this boldly saying increasing cesarean sections in Africa could save more mothers' lives. And yes, this was partly true, but if you look at the work that we did further, then you'll realize that access on its own isn't enough. So the unmet need for surgery as a whole, as you many of you will know, 1.3 billion people lack access to the most basic healthcare, 5 billion people lack access to safe, affordable surgery and anesthesia care when needed. 143 million additional surgical procedures are needed each year to save lives and prevent disability. And 33 million individuals face catastrophic health expenditure due to payment for surgery and anesthesia each year. So this is, is from the Lancet Commission for Global Surgery. And I'm just setting the scene uh, because I'm gonna move into neurosurgery shortly. If you look at who doesn't have surgery, it's obviously Africa and, and other low and middle income countries. So looking at, at access to care, you also need to look at delayed access. And I want you to think of this in the context of neurosurgery, that there's one, firstly, the decision for the patient to seek help or to seek health care, that that on its, on its own is, 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 the, is in, in many cases, is, is the hardest part when a patient feels that I'm feeling sick, but I'm not sure whether I should go look for help. And that is a common delay. And then we know issues such as transport and reaching the health facility and reaching the appropriate health facility is a big barrier. But for neurosurgery in Africa, I think the biggest barrier is receiving care. Because once the patient has gone through decision to seeking help, reaching the health facility, but getting to a place where no one is trained to provide the appropriate care that they need is what is stopping patients from, from being managed from diseases that can be treated. And this is what leads to patients dying from diseases that they would not die from anywhere else in the world. So what are the dimensions of access to care? So we know geographic accessibility is one of the biggest, one, biggest things, factors. But even if you provide a, a, health, a hospital or a health facility, availability is, is another thing. Financial accessibility. We know a lot of hospitals where patients need to have either health insurance or, you know, will not be treated if they will not be treated even by public uh, facilities. And then the acceptability in those hospitals where there's stigma that patients don't do well, even patients that can access them do not go. So it's important to think about access, not just geographically, but looking at other dimensions. So what is the unmet need for neurosurgery? There's an annual case deficit, uh, which is the number of essential neurosurgery cases needed beyond the current neurosurgical capacity. In numbers, 2 million cases in WHO's Africa region are required and two per year and 2.5 million in the Southeastern Asian region. So at least 4.5 million cases are required every year uh, in addition to what's being done uh, in Africa and Southeast Asia. So what strategies can be put in place so that patients can, can, can improve access to neurosurgery, not cesarean sections, I apologize. So I'm gonna move on to perioperative complications because now I think I've made a good case to say we need to improve access to care, but we can't talk about access without discussing the quality of care. So with cesarean sections, again, this was work that I did as part of my PhD, where we looked at causes of maternal death due to cesarean section related hemorrhage in South Africa. And what were the reasons for death? What were all the death, all the cases we had 
were avoidable. We had did a case series of 17 maternal deaths and all of them were avoidable. But what could have been done differently? Why did patients die? It was delayed transporting patients to a higher level of care. So in your case of neuro, where you've got a highly specialized skill, even if you, there's a delay, even if there isn't a delay transporting a patient, but to transfer a patient to a place where they cannot receive that care inevitably means that you'll have a higher mortality from, 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 from neurosurgical cases delays in starting the surgery, shortage of blood. So patients who bleed are not, do not have, there are no blood banks locally. Patients who need ICU, there were no ICUs available. Failure to detect shock and treat, delayed decision to perform second look surgery. And I think some of these things apply really to any, any surgical discipline. The numbers may be slightly different across disciplines, but I think these are the principles that, that, that highlight that it's not just about access, but it's about quality once you've got the patient in front of you. And then we also looked at why women, uh, at the women with complications, why women, uh, why women bled and how they were saved. And in this case, what we saw was that in hospitals where there was multidisciplinary care, women had better outcomes. And what I wanted to highlight here was what was done for the women that were saved. These are women that were able to have a hysterectomy, which of course on our end is complex obstetric gynae surgery. Women could have relook laparotomies that, that were bleeding. The dialysis was available, ventilation, uh, intensive care, inotropes, and the ability to transfer them to a higher level of care. So it also required that there was a functional transport system. So I mentioned these because it's important to look at, it's not just about task shifting, task sharing, but that small percentage which has complications. If people are not trained and if these surgeries are not being done in a safe environment where they have access to multidisciplinary specialists, and, and facilities that they require, it means that patients, even with good intentions, may not do well and end up having a high mortality from cases where you shouldn't. And then as you, 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 you know, as part of the African Surgical Outcome Study as an, as, as an obstetrician, and this was one of the groundbreaking studies that were done uh, led from, from UCT, which was a seven-day prospect, prospective observational cohort study. We did the sub-study where we looked at, at maternal outcomes. And so I took a look at the numbers from, from, from ESSOS and looked at the compared with neurosurgery, obstetric surgery, and gynae surgery. And so from the ESSOS study, they, did, they looked at 11,442 surgeries. Out of that, the obstetric surgery was the most widely performed. 33% of the surgeries were obstetric. Neurosurgery, only 2% of the surgeries that were performed were neurosurgery cases. Gynecology was 11%. How many patients had complications? Uh, again, 26% out of all those who had complications were from obstetrics. Then 4.3 out of those were, were neurosurgery. Patients who died, what were the mortality rates? So what's, what's interesting here is that the, the denominator is taken from all the patients that died. So out of the 33% of, of out of this, it's, it's out of the 239 patients who died in the study, 8.8% of them were, were those who had complications from neurosurgery and 8.4% of those who died were from obstetrics. So whilst the whilst there was a difference of 2% and 33% between the two groups, the number of patients that died were, was actually quite similar. And which is showing that the, the number of patients who had complications and who eventually died for, from, from neurosurgery cases was actually much higher than, than, than it should have been. And of course, there, there are many reasons for this, but it also highlights that one, there isn't enough neurosurgery 
surgery being done in Africa. And two, I think the mortality rate from the cases that are being done is disproportionately higher. So I'm gonna move into surgical system strengthening because that's what to us global surgery is really about. So highlighting that a health system consists of all organizations, people and actions whose primary intent is to promote, restore or maintain health. A health system is divided into several different components, a service delivery infrastructure, leadership and go governance, human resources, medicine and technology, finances and information. And so we always keep this in mind so that whatever questions we're looking at, we don't only ask service delivery questions, but also look at infrastructure, leadership, human resources. Then we've got, a, then we do research, we do work that is gonna strengthen the whole system is in its entirety and not only focusing on what the clinicians are doing. So in a, an approach to global surgery is health system strengthening, understanding that a key function of the health system is to implement interventions to improve health. How we have looked at health system strengthening, we have systems level interventions, we have targeted interventions. Targeted interventions are interventions that you can do in your own population, in your own community. It's looking at a problem that you have in front of you and saying, how can we come up with an intervention to solve it? Systems interventions, and a good example would be the NSOAP and saying, let's improve the, the policy at national level so that if we change the policy, then, uh, then, then the system will change and outcomes will then improve. So I've given examples here of targeted solutions, and this is just to stretch your thinking and, 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 and you know, as though as innovation happens, as new things are being done, we should also be responsive as Africans and start finding new ways of doing things. It's not only, I mean, I know I've used the telemedicine example, but I'm sure that there are places where even in neurosurgery where we could apply innovation and new ways of doing things that will ensure that more patients or more people are able to, to, to get better care. Another example I want to show, and this I highlight because it's not every solution that is good, or it's not every solution that works. You know, we've seen things that work, that have worked in other parts of the world, and sometimes we don't, we, 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 we are very modest in some of the interventions that we implement here in, 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 in Africa. And this something similar to this happened a few months ago with the pandemic, even here in South Africa, where we are improving things, but not, you know, not at a not 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 coming up with us sustainable solutions or solutions that 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 will work and so this 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 happened in an African country it happens across other countries where even today ambulance systems that are created are still being used driven by by animals for me as an obstetrician if a patient is bleeding or having a fit and needs to reach the nearest hospital there's no way that they'll survive if they are being moved in in transport that is not reliable. The end soap, uh, as you all should know about, I mean, I, uh, these are examples of systems level solutions. These are high level, need large groups of, of, of people and task teams working on them. And this is when you, you try to come up with system solutions. And I highlight this because yes, let's work on, on, on the end soaps, let's work on these interventions together collectively, but everyone in their country, in their hospital, in their health system can do something. And I think many of us as Africans need to start thinking of targeted solutions that we can implement in locally where we live. So what are neurosurgery solutions? And I took this from, from, from a paper that was published in 2019, global neurosurgery has largely, be, was largely about surgical camps and, and missions. And this has done a lot in many places, has brought the surgeons there, the operations happen, you know, people get treated, people get healed. But the downside is that the surgeons go back, uh, patients may remain with some complications, you know, you don't know what happens afterwards, but surgical capacity is not increasing through surgical 
surgical camps. And so surgical camps can, yes, the surgery is provided, but if, if you want something sustainable, you need to match it with surgical training. Then there's surgical training, which is about creating and more neurosurgeons and ensuring that they are being trained. And I believe there are more efforts across Africa to, and across the world to train African neurosurgeons, but we've got a long way to go. Education is where some of the task shifting and task sharing goes that you don't necessarily need to have a, a neurosurgeon in every community, but there are certain things and certain skills that you can, that you can teach and share with, with the health teams or with the clinicians and with clinicians that they can do and teach and, 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 and provide at least the minimum care that patients can receive. And then health system policy and advocacy is really a lot of what is being done by the global surgery com community. So what lessons can you learn from obstetric surgery? One, surgery is a human right. Two, access to surgery saves lives. Three, patients die from complications of surgery when, when in, in, in areas where there are weak health systems and strengthening surgical su systems will save more lives. So I believe we need to put a lot more effort in coming up with targeted and system level solutions to strengthen surgical systems. Lastly, what I want to say is, is in, what's important for us to think about in, as Africans is also thinking about diversity and ensuring that there's gender and racial diversity in neurosurgery. A lot of countries, a lot of hospitals, institutions are happy still to have a minorities of women, minorities of, 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 of African uh, neurosurgeons. We need to ensure that women and, and, and people of color are inspired to become neurosurgeons. They are mentored, they are, they are, they are, they are mentored and they, they, they finish. They finish, they don't just come in, but they come into the program and they finish and they develop to become senior leaders, professors, academic leaders as well. And so if we only think about increasing the number, if we only look at the clinical lessons and forget about diversity, because when we have African neurosurgeons who understand our populations, who understand the communities they come, we come from, one, they will mentor more people and people from the local communities, and they will understand the problems and come up with better targeted solutions. So I just put a picture there of, 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 of Dr. Uh, Dr. Gamfundis, who was also uh, recognized as, as Africa, as South, as one of South Africa's most powerful women in 2019. So in conclusion, Global neurosurgery is an, is, is, is an emerging field which seeks to strengthen surgical systems through interventions that improve access to surgery and the quality of perioperative care. And we all have a part to play in all of this, ensuring that we come up with, with, with solutions that will strengthen the health system locally and locally, nationally, and internationally. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Professor Salome. Thank you so, so much for this amazingly rich presentation. Thank you for taking the time to prepare this beautiful presentation. Um, uh, as a comment, I wish to say um, it is uh, important, as you said, it's important to have a uh, tailored solution to our problems that Africans face, the problems faced by the various communities in which we are present. And uh, um, that comes also to, to solve those problems, you need to uh, know them better. And to know them better, we need to carry on research on uh, those specific problems. And uh, um, I wish to congratulate you already for the great work uh, you guys are doing at the University of, um, of Cape Town and uh, in the in, in training global uh, What is your experience training these uh, global survey experts? In your, in your town, what has been your experience? So we've only really, I mean, we established the Global Surgery Division to in, in 2019. And so we really started taking our, our fellows, our first cohort of, of fellows middle of, of last year. It's a very small group. 
And we also supported people that were doing other degrees, not just the MSc and PhD global surgery, but other degrees that had uh, that uh, that had a topic that was global surgery. I mean, it's it's been amazing to 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 work with a dynamic group of 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 young and old people who who really want to make a difference. And I think what is special about working with people in global surgery is just the passion that they have to do research, to, to come up with solutions and, and to find new ways of, of, of doing things. And so we, we, we are now looking at our second cohort of students and, and excited to, to, to work with, with the second group that will come on. But the, the experience has really been that, you know, we get people from different fields and it's not just the surgeons, it's, it's, it's we work with nurses, we work with, with physiotherapists, we work with, you know, occupational therapists, everyone sees a role that they can play. And, we, and our frameworks are constantly, you know, evolving and changing and improving for the better. But whilst we've been learning what global surgery means in Africa, We've also been uh, amazed to work with amazing, young, talented people who really want to make a difference. Thank you very much, Professor Salome. Sydney, who says, uh, I'm, I'm reading. Thank you, Salome, Professor Maswini. What was your experience putting together the African, the African Peri Operative Outcome Study? Practical difficulties and tips for the future uh, prospective multi institutional studies. Uh, thank you for the question. And I mean, the, the PI for the study was, was Prof. Uh, Bruce Bickard, who, I mean, did an amazing, amazing job. I think this is really one of the studies that just stands out for, for the global surgery community. And so my part was really small in that I advised on, on the obstetric Part, part of things in the sub-study in designing the, the questionnaire, ensuring that there was a second questionnaire, which was about cesarean section, and also in translating the outcomes. But I think putting together a study this big with so many you know, people involved in every count, you're having research sites across multiple countries uh, and working with very little money. You know, a lot of the global surgery work, especially when driven by us as Africans is not, is not funded or the funding is minimal. We don't attract these huge, large grants that allow us to, to run these studies as we would like to. So I think the real practical challenges were in, in, in creating these, this massive research group to do this work and to collect this data and send it through. But I think the team that was, you know, having so many team players, I think the, the team that led the study as a whole did, did a great job. Uh, I, let me just check. I think, I hope I've answered. Uh, how can practical, yeah, uh, I think I've answered the question. You, yeah, if I haven't, you can ask further. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, you have answered the question rightly. So uh, you have the next question is from Taco Timbejo, who is uh, who wants to know how can medical students be actively involved in a global surgery? What can be the input of medical students? Uh, thank you again. And I think for me, you know, anyone who knows me close enough will know that, you know, I love working with medical students. You know, that is one of, that I think has been one of our successes as a team, working with, with, with bright medical students who have all of these amazing ideas, who actually want to do research. And I think what was special for me is, 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 is medical students who, who, who want to grow and learn and the, the level of initiative that they have, the, the volunteerism to, to get involved in research and, and to doing global surgery work. And I think those are the things that practical things that medical students can do in your institutions to say, finding 
finding people that are interested, asking them if you can get involved in studies, can they mentor you, can they teach you, can we design a study together, can we write a paper together and not waiting for, for someone to create an opportunity. So we've got a global surgery students group which has got eight students. Amongst them, they are doing three studies, which we've grouped them in, in small groups. And I meet with them every month to see, to, get, to, to, to track their progress. So, uh, but a lot of the initiative from our side was driven by, by the students. It wasn't us who went out to say, please do this, but they came to us saying, can we partner in this? And, and last year, some of you will be aware, we hosted our first conference with the South African Surgical Students Society. And it was an amazing conference. We managed to get uh, uh, the, the Director General, Dr. Chedros as, as, as a keynote speaker. And this was an invite from students and he supported this, this, this mission, also acknowledging that it was, he was happy that it was students who, was dri who were driving this initiative. So I think it's, 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 it's that it's taking initiatives to do this and not waiting for someone to hand pick you to say, please go and do this. Thank you very much, Professor Salome. So they have to be proactive. They have to go in for it. Thank you very much. So Dr. Aminata has uh, raised her hand. She has a comment. Dr. Aminata, you can go on. Yes, actually, I have a question. Um, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, Professor. Um, my question is that um, as medical students and registrars, we are trying to do our bit at our level. Do you know whether, as far as regional, regionally or continentally, there are bodies or groups that are seized with these problems in global surgery and neurosurgery who, so to speak, have our back and um, that we can count on the fact that they are also pondering and worrying about this and are uh, trying to take action. Uh, thank you. And it's, it's, I mean, global surgery is a young division. It's a, it's a young discipline, especially in, 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 in Africa, because we have, I suppose, probably caught up late with the rest of the world and, and only now starting to, to create bodies and systems and, you know, putting systems in place. So even in South Africa, there's only three institutions out of, you know, so many universities out of about eight medical schools where global surgery is recognized as a discipline. Across Africa, I don't even know. I think, you know, I, I, I don't know if there are many other, uh, you know, divisions. We are constantly looking for people to collaborate with across the continent. There are groups like the, this, the, there's the, firstly in South Africa, we've got the South African Global Surgery Society, which is also driven, you know, by, 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 by registrars, by students, by a team of dynamic people. We've got the, the, the SADC technical working group. It's more about policy and ensuring that NSOPs uh, are implemented across very, the SADC countries, but there's always an open invitation for students to join this group. And, and many of you will probably know people in your countries that are doing uh, global surgery work. So there isn't at present an African group that I know, but I'm very keen on being part of it when, when, when it starts. So I think we really need to, to all hold hands and, and, and create something that Africa needs uh, for global surgery to, 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 to strengthen across. And I agree the, the mentorship and support to, to, to the more junior cadres is, is important and it is our responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominata. Thank you, Professor Salome. So uh, I have a last question here. So uh, we just celebrated the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And uh, we wish to know, Professor Salome, what is your advice for ladies and girls who, who are willing to engage into research and science and global theory? So one, I mean, being myself uh, as I, I as a, a young scientist, I, I, I do carry that title and uh, as, you know, my, I know I'm a bit older than, but I, I, I still carry the title of being a, a young scientist. I'm a World Economic Forum young scientist. And 
you know, I that question is it's a deep question that can be answered on so many levels. Because the first thing is there's nothing that stops us from women as as from becoming scientists, from becoming, from contributing to science. And I think that's that's first and foremost that as women, we need to see ourselves as scientists and, and we need to get in that, into that space and occupy it and, and, and not be afraid to go into that, you know, cause there's nothing stopping us. But I think the challenges that women face are also interesting and, and peculiar and the same, I think it, it, it's not very different from, from the decision to become a neurosurgeon, you know, or, or, or many other things in the medical field where, you know, uh, you need to look at, you know, I, I'm a young woman, you know, may want develop having a family, being a mother, having children, all of those things come into play and, and, and we need more interesting support systems that allow us to, to do the things that we want to do and we need to create those and support each other as women. So my basic advice to women, I think first of and foremost is that, is that we, we are highly capable and nothing should stop us from pursuing uh, the dreams that we have in science and, and then once you're in there, let's let's create support systems for women to thrive there. And I think that's another webinar on its own. Thank you very much, Professor Salome. We wish to thank everybody who came here today for this webinar and a special gratitude to Professor, Sal Professor Maswine for taking time out of a tight schedule to speak to us today. So uh, thank you very much for coming. We are going to end the recording here.